Today on The Perspective with Mike Sherpineau and Julie Stoutland. When it comes to leadership and prosperity in business, looking to someone who has reached the pinnacle of success allows us to learn a lot. Today on The Perspective, Hobby Lobby CEO and founder David Green started out in business with a $600 loan, an idea and a deep faith. Built a company based on biblical values and sheer determination. The company has sales of over $8 billion a year and 50,000 employees. Now in their 50th anniversary year, David is joined by his co-author Bill Hyde to talk about their latest book, Leadership Not by the Book. Bill Hyde says he works in the generosity world and through his own growing organization, The Signatory, the two are forming incredible legacies. Over to you, Mike and Julie, with David Green and Bill Hyde joining us from Hobby Lobby headquarters in Oklahoma City. You know, have you ever thought about the decisions that you make? Someone said, you can make a decision, it'll turn around and make you. So Julie, have you ever made a decision where you just kind of cringed about an hour later or a oh, day later? I wish I could say no, but way too many times. Way too many times. <laughs> but have you ever made a good decision say, yeah, that was the one? Yes, and then you just feel like this wave of peace, like, yes, that was a right thing to do. Well, later on in the program, I'm going to be talking about making decisions. We're going to be talking about it all this week out of the life of Joshua. I remember I've cringed on some of the decisions <laughs> I've made, but some of the big decisions, like even moving and starting churches and launching this ministry, mm -hmm. just having a sense saying, oh, this is the right thing. But I've discovered that for people who make good decisions, what is critical is leadership. It is. And having people to speak into your life, to give direction to organizations. And we have two gentlemen here today who really top the charts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, leadership seems to be the topic of conversation these days. And it's no surprise as so many people feel stuck in limbo, even rudderless, thanks to too much going on in our world, too much information, and the need and craving for good leadership. But well, we have that in abundance today with David Green and Bill High. I just want to welcome you gentlemen today yes, yes. to our program. Thank you for joining you. us. Glad to be here. Well, you guys have a remarkable story. And uh, maybe we could just talk about your latest book mm -hmm. that's called Leadership Not by the Book. But just in case people don't recognize the name, uh, David Green obviously is... Mr. Hobby Lobby, and we've already <laughs> talked about how much money I've invested in that company. That's good. Appreciate yeah. it. And uh, Bill High is uh, not only your co-author, but he is uh, CEO of The Signatory. And that's just an exciting organization that is benefiting so many people. But David and Bill, let's talk about your book. How did it all come about? Well, I would have to say by... Bill pushing me because he wanted me to write a book, you know, thank God he did, by the way, because I'm very, very happy just being a retailer and staying in my corner. But he really, <laughs> he really encouraged me to put together what God has done in our business. And that's what we've tried to do with this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, David, we had a lot of people. I mean, we ho hold events where leaders from all over the country, actually, we just got finished with the event and we had people from coast to coast who came in 20, 30 people at a time or more at times. And over the years, as we've hosted these events, these leaders would come up to us and say, you got to write the leadership book. Now, mm. we've done a couple other books, but they, they particularly we had people even from Harvard and Stanford and they'd say, David, you, you run this business and it doesn't make any sense. So why does it work? And that's ultimately how we came up with that title, Leadership Not by the Book. So when they would actually say that your leadership just doesn't make sense, you got to, were you smiling a little bit inside? Well, yes, because really we'd like to say it's by the book. And so hopefully we're trying the best that we can to see what God's word says about things. One of the big things for us in our life is what do we do with what God has given us? Right. And so we've come to the conclusion that we do not own this business, not because we say so, but God's word says he owns everything. Mm -hmm. So there's no way I can own Hobby Lobby if God does. Mm -hmm. So now how does that look and how do we play that out? And that's part of what the book's about is how do we play out what God owns, not what we own? So we've decided that based on scriptures, that we're nothing but servants. And we love that. 
uh, just serving uh, and being stewards. So we're the stewards of what God has given us. And how does that play out? And that's what the book goes into. You know, I want, I want to jump here in here and say that my husband and I, we, we run a couple of businesses. And, and in the book, you talk about on this issue, the secret sauce. So <laughs> what does this mean? It sounds like Colonel Saunders' know, recipe, right? but anyways. And, and how does this apply to our lives? Talk about the secret sauce. Well, I think in the book, we show several different things we think is secret sauce. You know, there's just a lot of different places. One may be just the fact that you want to take care of those that brought you where you are mm. and to do everything you can for them. And so there's a lot of things on our corporate office and in our company, like closing on Sunday. That's a secret sauce that mm. we care about our people. How do they care about you if you don't care about them? So there's a lot of different areas in this book and different chapters. It says this is one of the things that is our secret to make Hobby Lobby work the way it does. And of course, it all goes back, we hope, and that we have done it based on biblical principles. So one of the secret sauces is it is by the book, but not by the normal book of leadership. Mm. Yeah, David, I, I want to add on to what you said. I, it's probably easier for me to tell this story. Uh, one of the privileges that I had is I got to interview some of the C-level leaders, and I would always ask them the question, what is the secret sauce? It was actually one of your chaplains, Debbie, that talked about the idea that the, the, the real big key is that at the end of the day, David tries to hear from God and obey, uh, even if it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, does it, David? No, not at all. Not at all. You know, talk to me about that just a little bit. What does it mean to listen for God's voice? And, and how do you do that, if I could ask? Maybe both of you want to chime in on that answer. Well, for me, I tell people that I think that uh, the by I, I go by a few scriptures that kind of helps me to keep it simple. And one of them, the Bible talks about praying without ceasing. When you go through a day at work, there's a lot of things that can come up in the day's time. So I think it's really a good thing to follow that scripture that says just pray without ceasing. And one of the ways that makes me do that, I think, more effectively is the scripture that says God never leaves you or forsakes you. So I just see him with me all day long. And so I can talk to him all day long. And this is what I would like to do even more than I do now. And then the other scripture that comes to mind when I'm thinking about this and praying is that you have not because you ask not. Mm. Now, I'm not asking for things for my personal gain, but I would like to Hobby Lobby to be larger so that we can do more in ministry. So that's the things that I want to ask for, for him to help us succeed so we can do more things in the ministries that we're involved in. Mm. Well, David, some, sometimes we go to lunch too, though, and you start talking to me about your latest project, whether it's working on scissors or ribbon and, you know, and I'm like, man, you're geeking out on some of this stuff. But that's part of the point is that here's a guy that prays about the littlest details. And it's easy sometimes as leaders to think that we're really confident that we know what we're doing, but you keep crying out and saying, God, help me to understand even the smallest parts of the business so that we can be better for your sake. You know, if you're a good, if you're a good person at delegating and you have all these great leaders, and then you could get really, really bored if you don't get into the weeds. So one of the <laughs> things that I do is I get into the weeds. And I, I can talk about scissors for two weeks. In fact, at breakfast, I asked my wife, if you'll listen to me one more time about scissors, I'll buy you a new pair of shoes. So I loved, and Bill calls me a geek. You know, when I start talking about, uh, I can talk about ribbon for hours. And uh, so anyway, I think it's important that as leaders that we also get into the weeds where it's really happening. But to do that, you really have to have a bunch of great leaders in various departments. Mm -hmm. And God has given us that. You know, after you shared that, I don't think I'll ever walk into a Hobby Lobby again and keep a straight face when I see the tweezers, the scissors, <laughs> and the ribbon. Like, guys, uh, Bill, what about you? Do you go into the weeds? You know, that's one of the big things that I've learned from David. It, it really is that idea that you've got to pray about the little things. And just that constant reminder about, again, it's the things that you think you're skilled at. And you think, man, I got to back up and say, Lord, how do you want to speak into this? I get to work with a lot of families, too, around the country that are trying to figure out some of these same ideas like uh, the Green family and the Hobby Lobby family. And they're just things that I don't understand sometimes that I got to call out and say, God, I don't understand. Help me to understand. 
Wow. That's so good. That is so good. Listen, we're, we're going to take a short break because there's so much more we want to talk about. So stay with us, everyone. We're going to be right back. So many people ask us why we do things differently, that we ought to put together a book that says leadership not by the book. This is our 50th year anniversary. We've had a lot of experience of doing things right and doing things wrong. But in a lot of cases, we do things just different because we've tried to study why we do things. There's so many things we do different. I'm sure some of them are not right, but I don't know which one it is. So I'm just leaving things alone. So much of this really falls back on the book. The book, of course, being the Bible. So hopefully uh, from reading this book, you'll see that as much as possible, we want to try to follow the book in everything we do. We're here again with uh, David Green and Bill High. And gentlemen, both your stories read like a Hollywood movie. Uh, Bill, would you give us a little bit of the backstory? And then as you shared, then I'm going to ask David if he would share a little bit of his story with Hobby Lobby and how it started. Yeah, David and I actually grew up pretty similar, both families of six. I was number five. He was number five. Very poor families. But I, I came to faith and ended up going to law school, practicing law, and had the privilege of being able to come in and begin working with the family about 20 years ago. And just uh, actually, there's been a big rise of Hobby Lobby, even over that 20-year 20, 20 period. But it's been a great privilege and journey to, to walk alongside David and the family as they've had some of these adventures in uh, the charitable giving world, working with families, working with leaders. Mm. Amazing. David, what about your story? Maybe you could fill in a few more details. Yes, I came from a pastor's home. I had five brothers and sisters, and all of them were either pastor's wives or they were pastors, except for me. <laughs> so I saw, I saw myself as the black sheep in the family for many, many years. Wow. Eventually, I learned because of different things that happened in my life that I'm also just as called to do what I do as my brothers and sisters. And I also say not only that, but I'm anointed to do what God asked me to do and what he's given me to do as long as I'm walking beside him, beside him and also in prayer time. So those, that's where I came from. So when I was in high school, I, I, I started working at a local five and dime store. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife is where I met my wife. And so in Altus, Oklahoma, I found my, the love of my, my life, which I've been married for 61 years. Mm -hmm. And I also found the love for my career. So I found two things in Altus, Oklahoma, and that's where we got started in the five and dime business. Mm -hmm. So eventually we decided we wanted to start our business of our own. And that's when we borrowed $600 and started making uh, frames in our garage. And from there, we opened our store, first store here in Oklahoma City, which was about the size of a living room. So that's what happened in 1972 was our first, first store. So that's 50 wow. years ago. So now we have about, uh, we're going to have a we'll go to the 1,000th store next spring. So that's what God has done during this period of time. I, I love how it, it's such a groundbreaking, small beginnings, just, just your family starting this and just to see how it is growing. It's just a wonderful way to see this plant grow. And I, I want to move on. I read a little bit in your book where there was one story you shared, David, how you were underneath your desk one day and you were ignoring the phones, you weren't looking at anything, and you were just crying out to God in prayer. So with that, I want to say, David, how do the trials of life make us stronger? Because obviously you were in a trial there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that we have any character in our lives at all if we don't have trials. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm not trying to protect my kids and make sure that they don't go through what, I, what I've gone through. I don't know anybody that doesn't have character, that has character that hasn't had a lot of hard times. Mm -hmm. And we certainly have. God gives us those to do miracles in our life. It's hard to have a miracle in your life if you don't have a trial. Mm -hmm. And it was in the mid 80s, that the oil bust happened here in Oklahoma City, the banks were threatened to foreclose on us, that I found myself under my desk just crying out to God, helping us to get out of where we were. And it took a little while, but God eventually took us to where that uh, Hobby Lobby was strong again. You know, as you tell that story, Bill, I'd like to jump to you for just a moment. Um, this conversation has been peppered with talks about how you've been listening for God's voice, both of you gentlemen, how he's led and how he has guided you. But at a, at a deep level, Bill, how does your faith inform your decisions? 
I want to come back to that little word decisions. Yeah, that's a, a really great question. And, and what you have is, of course, on a day by day basis, you can have a thousand decisions. And it is common. You, you heard David talk about sometimes you get into those situations where you just don't know what to do. And you've got two options. You can get paralyzed to inaction or you can take a step forward. And that step forward requires faith. And that's where the idea, at least in the scriptures, the Bible talks about that God goes before us. He truly goes before us. And he's going to lead us to the right place. And it's that underlying belief of all these times that God has gone before us that you can say, I can take that next step mm. in faith. So mm. both of you, if you could help me with this question, do you ever have moments when you're sort of riding the fence when it's a business decision? You know, is it a good one? Is it a bad one? You're trying to, how do you sort through that? Oh, yeah, all the time. That's the 5149 principle, yeah. isn't it, David? Yeah. We talk in business, I say every decision I make is a 60, 40 or 41, 59. It's like there's very few decisions. It's 100, zero. Mm -hmm. When we sued the government because they were going to force us to do uh, uh, contraceptives that we couldn't do, that was 100 and zero. This is wrong to do. But a lot of things we do are like that. But part of the, that is what does the scripture say? So that helps you in a lot of cases. But there's not a scripture for everything you do. So I think that was walking with God all day long, asking him to go before you and in helping your decisions. I think he comes alongside you and helps you with those decisions. Now, while I'm not doing that, by the way, I've made an awful lot of wrong decisions. So as you get older, hopefully you learn a little bit. And I'm trying now more than ever to make any decision of any size to, I call it, let him vote. So how do I let God vote? And so that I know that this is exactly where he wants me to be. Yeah, even on things like scissors. Yeah, even things that, <laughs> hey, you're working with scissors and you say, God, help me, because if I can sell more scissors, we can be more profitable. And the more profitable we are, the more uh, we can do in ministry. Right. I mean, that's it. And I, I want to go on and ask this. At the end of the book, you talk about keys to divine favor. So, David and Bill, how does the Bible play into the success of Hobby Lobby. And David, do you want to take that one first? Well, one of the things that I, I hope that I'm, I'm saying to you that you're answering your question is there's a lot of things that we do that when we closed on Sunday, uh, when we uh, sued the government, there's so many things that we do. We stopped selling Halloween. And I tell people, and every time we do something right, it actually costs us Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think God wants it to where you're going to do the right thing for the wrong reason, the right thing, because you want to have a more profitable business. I think God wants us to do the right thing for the right reason. And so we try to make sure that we're doing it for the right reason. And that, because this is what the scriptures say. So I tell people about everything we've ever done. that has cost us money. looks like it's cost us money. It has cost us money. But because <laughs> of that, it's because of that that I think we get this divine over. It's much huger how God blesses us than with the cost that we pay for doing the right thing. So God has blessed us beyond anything that we can think of. But I believe it's because he wants us to continue to do the right things, even though it costs. Yeah, David, I'd probably go, go a little bit di different direction, too, there is that Sometimes you've got to take a risk. You've got to take a risk for the right reason. And the idea of taking, that's one of the chapters in the book is maximizing risk. And when you take a risk for the right reason to take care of people, to serve people, to love them, to point them to uh, the light, uh, the light of the gospel, that's how God's going to reward you. You're going to get favor and blessing, even if you don't always know that it's one of those hundred to zero kind of questions. Well, I'm so glad that you said that because you keep coming back in somewhat of an orthodox way, uh, two CEOs of, of organizations, and you, you talk about how do we advance the gospel, and that just excites me. Uh, I'm in a teaching series right now where we're talking about serving, we're talking about stewardship, and we're talking about advancing the gospel, and I don't think I need to preach next week. I'm just going to play this interview because <laughs> you guys have spoken so well into our hearts, and... I want to thank you. You know, our time is up, but I just sense I need to give each of you 
uh, a final word. If you could impart to Canadian viewers today something that is just close to your heart, what would it be? To a businessman, I would say you have to get to the point where you don't just say that God owns it. You have to say, what does it look like? So when you get there, your ministry, you have a ministry instead of a business. And this is how you should see your business, is this is a ministry. How can I affect lives for eternity? Because there's only two things that's eternal, and that's man's soul and God's word. So we want to be in part, a, a part of something that matters a thousand years from now. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add on to that. It's that idea you're going to want to build for 150 years. We just really need to change our perspective that we're living lives that we think are just a moment. But the impact that we can have for hundreds of years if we live out our faith in a real way is a powerful thing. And the last chapter of the book kind of sums it all up, which says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whether you're the hamburger flipper, whether you're a shepherd boy that might become a king, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Great messages. Great messages. Thank you guys so you. much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to meet you, David and Bill. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. All right. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. I want to take this moment to tell you why we do the perspective. And Julie, there are two words going through my mind. <laughs> I know what they are. What are they? Hope and help. You got it. You knocked it out of the park. <laughs> Hope and help are so important. And can I just share with you as the viewing audience that we want people to experience the hope that happens when they put their trust in Jesus. I know it transformed my life. It will transform yours if it hasn't already. We also want to help people and through the many interviews and as we teach God's Word, to help people to realize that the Lord is with us, that He is our refuge and strength. So could I ask you to help me give hope to people across our country? Why not go to the link below and donate to support the perspective and together we can give hope and help to our country. You know, with our two businesses that my husband and I run, I've never been excited about the idea of like making money for the sake of money. It only excites me that if we're going to make money, what are we going to do with it that's going to make a difference, something that's going to last, something that's going to impact people's lives. So listening to, to Bill and David talk today just really got me fired up. Like, this is so important. This is the whole reason why we are doing business. It's ministry like you're doing ministry in a different way. And I think the other thing about making money that people need to realize is that becoming a generous person doesn't happen when you have a bucket load of money. Exactly. It starts when you, all you have is 10 bucks in your pocket mm -hmm. and saying, and you know, the need comes along to share, to help somebody. And so I hope you'll think about that as everything in life involves a decision. And as I was sharing yesterday, that through this week, we're teaching a principle out of Joshua chapter 3. And Joshua has taken over as the leader. Moses is dead. And on two different occasions in the uh, first chapter of Joshua, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. It's like God is making a statement. There's the end of an old season, and there's the beginning of a new. And when you make a decision, it's the end of something, and it's the beginning of a new something. And I don't know what that can be in your life. It might be in a relationship. Maybe you're looking at a new job. Maybe you're making a, a decision to move, uh, to downsize possibly, or maybe to upsize for various reasons, but you're making that decision. I've discovered that when you make a decision, it really becomes a defining moment. And I want to talk to you today about several defining moments out of the book of Joshua, but it's going to lead us as we come to the conclusion uh, in tomorrow's talk about how we make these big decisions. But here's some defining moments that can shape our life. First of all, it's the whole moment of how you and I handle pain or success. One of the great truths in the scriptures found in Romans 8 verse 28, it says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Now, we all want to be well and wealthy and wise. And uh, for you old Star Trek fans, maybe it's the Vulcan blessing, live long and prosper. But no doubt about it, how you and I handle pain and success will be a defining moment. We've just had an interview with two men who are handling success. 
And that really is one of their defining moments. But what happens in those dark nights of the soul? I've had a few that I've reflected on from time to time. And perhaps on one of the darkest nights that I ever went through, I came into a, a prayer group early the next morning, hadn't had much sleep. I was a few minutes late, and the man who had started the, uh, the Bible discussion, he was reading from the scripture. He said, Michael, he said, we've just been reading from this passage that says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And what I had experienced the night before didn't feel too good. It was painful. It brought huge tears and sorrow to my heart. But I was reminded that God is there. You know, how you handle pain or success is a defining moment. But how you handle the unexpected is another defining moment. And Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, it says that God's grace is sufficient. It's more than enough. Years ago, when I was a young pastor, I went to the bedside of a lady who had been hit by a drunk driver. She had lost her leg, and now she was battling cancer. She was just a frail wisp of a woman. And I wondered at the age of 23 what I'd ever say to her to encourage her and give her perspective. How had she handled all the unexpected things in life? And she motioned for me to come close. And if I close my eyes, I can still feel her breath against my ear as she whispered to me these words. She said, Michael, God's grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. And I've never forgotten that because you see how you handle the unexpected is so critical. You're going to face unexpected moments. Make no doubt about it. And you need to be equipped. As we said yesterday, the time to be prepared for a crisis is before you are in it. I think another defining moment, though, is how you approach relationships. You know, in John 13, 15, Jesus says, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Well, what was it that he had just done? He had washed the disciples' feet, the ultimate act of being a servant. Can you think about your relationships right now that are struggling? Could it be that you need to show the servant's heart to your spouse, to your children, or maybe your colleague at work. I don't know, but let God speak to you. Because there's a fourth thing, and it's what Julie and I were talking about that is a defining moment in your life, and it's how you handle money and what you think about it. You know, do you own your money or does money own you? Those are big questions to ponder because many of us are driven by our want for more, to have more. And what Paul says to Timothy is that godliness with contentment is great gain. I hope that you're content. Maybe the biggest defining moment, and at least in my life it is, is who you choose to serve, because that's going to impact all the other decisions. Joshua would say later on at the end of his life, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I want to invite you today to seriously consider God's invitation to follow him, to serve him, and to give him your all. You'll never regret it. 